I have a slide here about California home ownership rate. There you can see that the home ownership rate for California has fluctuated in the past between 53 and a half and up to 60%. And now we see about 54%. I also saw that real estate price in California are holding up uh, pretty well, even if the rates are rising at the moment. It's due to the demand and supply mismatch over there. I also saw that geographically, California is one of the lowest ownership rates in the US. And I was wondering if Sage Ranch is more suited for homeowners or for investors or for a combination. What's, what's the approach there to, to what kind of buyer will you get the, the best results? Well, that question has a lot of depth to it. So I'll start off. There's a, there's a few answers there. The number one aspect of Sage Ranch, and I would, I would not have Greenbrier involved in Sage Ranch if the mortgage payment would be higher than the rent for an equivalent home. So Sage Ranch prices, even with escalation in prices, is 20 to 30% cheaper at a minimum than if you try to rent something of equal nature. And you, and you can't because there's really no new inventory of any size whatsoever in, the, in that valley of 38,000 people that we generally know as to Hatchby, even though there's a geopolitical subdivision called the city, and then there's a majority in the non-incorporated area, and they have names like Cummings Valley and Bear Valley and what have you. That 38,000 people, there's virtually no new inventory to meet the demands of people that want to live there. So let's start with the, the medical foundation here of Sage Ranch and why this is so beneficial to Greenbrier shareholders. First of all, this particular property is in the center of the city and it is a region, a small region in the center of the city that is under the, the, the purview of the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, even though it's, it's 38,000 people you can get what's called a USDA loan for Sage Ranch as a homeowner. So even with current rates, USDA loans require no down payment. Sometimes they require down payment of 2%. And you have an interest rate, even with the 10-year uh, yield at around 3.1%, a USDA loan is currently between 1.9% and 2.2%. And the amortization of the mortgages is 38 years. So if you look at the average product and let's go by Altus and say it's a $430,000 product, which, which we believe will be higher, but let's just stick to Altus. Let's stick to the golden standard, $430,000 home at 1.9%. You know, your mortgage payment's going to be about 1400 bucks a month, $1,500 a month. So in this regard, you try to rent a home like that, and you're going to be paying at least $2,500 and you're not going to get a new home. So the delta between renting and mortgage is in favor of buying and the USDA, there is a qualification. I think you can't earn more than 85,000 a year. So, but I'm into the game of, you know, looking after people that need a home. I don't want to be in the position of like, say there, there's a bunch of national builders in the U S right. So on the low end, you have KB homes. And then on the high end, you have like Toll Brothers. I don't want to be in the Toll Brothers position. Toll Brothers average home in the U.S. is around a million bucks for the projects that Toll Brothers builds. You don't want to be in that. You don't want to be in that scenario in a nine hundred one million dollar development scenario because when interest rates go up, as they're going up right now, one person you need two for a million dollar home. You only need two people to have a job for the most part. One person loses their job or simply interest rates are up and uh, fuel prices are up, inflation's up, and there's an impairment in your net income of 12 or $1,500 a month, you, don't, you can't qualify for that mortgage or you're in, a, you're in a deficit position. So you're simply not gonna buy that home. I would rather be at the complete bottom of the scale. Now, when I say bottom of the scale, I don't mean section eight housing where you're building something. And I, I have seen some nice brand new section eight housing where you're getting tax credits to build the project. And basically on, for the side of Sage Ranch, if, if this was a section eight housing project, which it's not, the entire construction cost would be, would be really subsidized by the U S government. This is not a section eight house, but I would, I would rather be a level above a section eight, meaning economically, I would rather build a high quality product, but, but small. And that was 
That's why the city allowed the project. We said, look, we want to build something high quality, but you can't build a 2,500 square foot high quality home, you know, and sell them even with production homes, which production home construction cost is less than half of the cost that you'll see in any major city in the United States, like by far less than half for a multitude of reasons. And if anybody wants to, you know, wants to get into the dynamics of that, I'm more than happy to have that conversation. Altus was telling us about a subdivision that they were back, that they were reporting on as a bank's overseer, 30 miles east of of Austin, Texas, and their their verticals were 85 bucks a square foot. So or verticals means the cost of building the house. You know, another fifty dollars for the improvements and permitting and whatever, 135 a square foot. Altus has us at 99 dollars and 26 cents per square foot as the verticals, and that and those verticals are not the highest price of lumber but higher than the highest price. So if lumber is currently $13,000 for a thousand board feet, they booked it at $18,000 per board feet. So everything Altus did was mark everything up. And, and with those markups of higher costs, we're still at 99.26. We're approximately 48, $49 on the improvements in the laterals. So all in at about $150 a square foot. We said 280 a square foot on the sales side. We believe we're low. Alta said, no, it's not going to accept 280. It's going to accept 272. Okay, fine. Let's take that as a number. But the thing is you can't build those homes outside of production homes um, anywhere in California. You have to be in an inland area. You got to be away from the coast. You got to be in a place that um, does not resemble, you know, Los Angeles, San Francisco, greater LA, what have you. And in that regard, the value proposition that I'd rather be at is what the city agreed to. And that is let's build a high quality home, but let's do it where the liquidity is of the price. So if we did 2,500 square foot homes and we we're trying to sell them for $750,000, that's an attractive price in many areas, but that's not where the liquidity is in the market in Tehachapi. The liquidity now in the greater area, if you look at transactions today, is around the $460,000 range. So you want to be, you got to be in that 460 liquidity mark. So do you buy a 1800 square foot home that's 35 years old in Tatch Bay at for $460,000, or do you buy one that's brand new for 1300 square feet in Sage Ranch? And we're getting a selling price net of around 320 or 330 a square foot. I would rather be, I'd rather get a new home. So I think if you ask any potential home buyer, They'd rather sacrifice three or 400 square feet, have a brand new product, be surrounded by schools, have the, all the amenities of the parks and the recreation and do that as opposed to having product that's 30, 35 years old. So we're catering to the market where everybody needs a home, right? There's 2.4 million houses short. There's a shortage of 2.4 million new homes in California. They're not at the $2 million price range. They're at the five to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar price range, and we're slightly below that. So we meet we meet the needs of everybody in Antelope Valley, which works for the aviation industry, whether it's SpaceX, Tesla, Northrop Grumman, Edwards Air Force Base, all the huge defense contractors that support the whole aviation industry. We're providing them product that they wanted for the last twenty years that they were not able to get because Tehachapi did not want to open itself up to any more population because it did not want the city to turn into what Palmdale and Lancaster has turned into. And I'm not afraid to say this, but Lancaster is a very gang infested, terrible place to live. And that's why the aviation industry and the military industry is having a very tough time, even completing defense contracts because it cannot get employees to live in Lancaster Palmdale. So their only option is to drive 50 miles, 55 miles to the south to Santa Clarita, which you're looking at home prices, new home prices of 1.3, 1.4 million. And then into, of course, another 10 minutes into the LA, the city of LA, and you're looking at average prices, you know, closer to $2 million, but you got to do two and a half hours of rush hour traffic every way, every, each way because of the amount of traffic that's there. So we left the intersection in a place called Sherman Oaks, which is a, which is the city of Los Angeles. We left it the, on the intersection of the 405 and the 101, and we got to attach me in 75 minutes. So this is a, definitely a, what we call an exurb. So an exurb is a, 
is the last population center within an earth with a, within a within a, a greater metropolis and we're there to satisfy the high paying jobs of the aviation industry that would rather live a 35 minute drive to the northwest and be in this very safe environment it's the safest city in kern county half the people are military and retired law enforcement they'd rather be there three months a year you get snow it's a very magical beautiful place of 38,000 people they'd rather be there than li living in palmdale lancaster which is out of the question or spending 1.3 million in Santa Clarita or 2 million living south. So we are not affected by the interest rates primarily because of the USDA and primarily because of our pricing. So, you know, there's obviously restrictions if interest rates go to 12 or 15%. I, I think everybody's going to have issues, but I don't think that's where the interest rate pricing is going. I, I, I do see you know, two or three more 50 basis point increases. But at that point, it's not sustainable for the U.S. government uh, to maintain its debt load. And then you, of course, have, at that point, you'd have, you know, very crushing stagflation, which the government doesn't want. So there's a multitude of primary reasons why Sage Ranch is good. And I think I've given them to everybody very clearly. Again, the most underpinning aspect is your mortgage payment would be far cheaper than any rent that you would get in the area. And I think that's the key, the most key uh, structural financial aspect is Sage Ranch. All right, thank you. Next, we have a few questions on Montelva. So GLB signed an offtake agreement for 25 years with PREPA in 2020. When you look up PREPA on Wiki, currently it's mentioning that it was dissolved in 2021 and superseded by Luma Energy. And we also know that GRB is in settlement discussions with PREPA on the Montelva solar farm project. And then a few questions about that. Does GRB only need to come to an agreement with PREPA or do you have to deal with other agencies, perhaps with Luma? And can you comment on the current state of the settlement that's ongoing between Greenbrier and PREPA? And the last two ones are, what about the offtake agreement with PREPA? Will Luma honor that if it's a, an option? And you already said that it can be extended, so you don't have to go in there again. Uh, the PPOA can be extended after 25 years with two terms of five years for 35 years in total. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I've read, again, read a bunch of information on Stockhouse that's incorrect because there's little pieces here and pieces there, and it, it fails to mention or neglects to mention filings that were made with PREB and updates that we've made all along. So in the case of, of Montalva, our contract was approved by the PREPA board of directors on May 28th, 2020. And then our contract with 15 other contracts went to the Puerto Rican Energy Bureau. And our project was ranked number one by the Puerto Rican Energy Bureau, the 20 page report. We did the official translation that's available. And that was July the 7th. And then it went to the over federal oversight board. It was the federal oversight board that was lecturing PREPA a few months before to get these contracts signed. In fact, the federal oversight board at the beginning of 2018 deemed our project to be a critical project. So we were very shocked. Everybody was shocked that in September of 2020, that the oversight board would say these contracts should not be approved. All of them should not be approved because they affect, you know, the energy prices. It, 46 years from now, instead of the average price being, you know, 33.1 cent, they're going to be 33.6 cents. So it was a very ludicrous ruling by the oversight board. The motivation was, you know, 66%, 65% of the generation on the island comes from burning oil. Oil is the most outdated, expensive, dirtiest, but let me restate a most expensive way of producing electricity anywhere in the world far more expensive than any other fossil generation you can have. It completely outdated, atrociously expensive. The head of the oversight board at the time, Natalie Jarowski, was obviously, she was a Ukrainian finance minister, was her previous job. There was a lot of influence she had by the oil and gas companies. The oil companies, when we went to Congress in 2018, and I spent the whole year, the two years, 2017, 2018, every month in Congress, talking about not a prep and not accepting these contracts to go through. There was a staff report put out by the chief of staff for the chairman of the natural resource committee. 
and it was a five, six page document on PREPA and the inefficiencies of PREPA. And it stated that from 2003 to 2017, that PREPA overpaid $18 billion on fuel costs buying oil that was substandard compared to the price it was paying. They paid 18 billion in overpayments. So think about this island of three and a half million people, you know, people living in the standards that they live and $18 billion goes missing. So this shows you the big influence of oil and what it had on the entire island and, and, and really still has. So when May 28th, 2020 came along, and by the way, at the time, the oversight board was on our side. It was before Natalie got appointed. There was a, the two hurricanes, but there was an earthquake in early January of 2020. It took out the 990 megawatt Costa sewer power station, and it took out the power station for a few weeks. So there was a power outage. And at that time, everybody in the political class, including all those involved in the oil and gas business demanded that the solar contracts be award, uh, awarded and approved. And they were. So five months later, May 28, 2020, February of 2020, you have the oversight board giving PREPA, scolding them publicly saying, get these solar contracts signed. Anyway, they're signed, they're approved by the board, approved by PREB, September, 2020, the oversight board now says no. So we began a, a, a appeal process. We made a whole bunch of applications. We did our formal complaints and our formal filings with the Puerto Rican Energy Bureau in March of 2021. We also prepared like an 18,000 page filing for the RFP, what we call tranche one, to protect ourselves, even though PREPA said, if you make public your contractual issues, you'll get disqualified. So not evaluated, disqualified. So we made the application in the RFP to protect ourselves, but two days later, they disqualified us, not on the merits of the project, simply because when we filed the public statement to the Puerto Rican Energy Bureau, that we were basically seeking an adjudicative law decision on Montalva, that was considered a public disclosure. And the, our tranche one application was put on hold because we, we now sought the Puerto Rican Energy Bureau to be the arbiter of our project, not, not PREPA. So that was filed in March of 2021. And that became the sole place where Greenbrier has being adjudicated, has, ha, where Greenbrier is adjudicating our case against the oversight board and PREPA, really PREPA, because if PREPA really wants to do something, the oversight board will agree. So when the oversight board said no, PREPA put up a big fight a few weeks later and then, and then backed away. And we kind of know the reasons they backed away. But in any event, we filed the case against the Energy Bureau. And from that day, March of 2021, that is where this arbitration has been going on. And so we went through this procedure. And as of four or five months ago, we've gone into official settlement negotiations. So if you look at any of the filings, including a current filing made two, three days ago by PREPA, that they've asked for extensions from the decision of the adjudicator to simply settle with Greenbrier. We call our subsidiary, it's called PBJL. Um, so we're in confidential settlement negotiations. I can't say, you know, I, I can't say where we are, but I can say that Luma has taken over the franchise of running the transmission and distribution. They're not in charge of approving contracts. Luma is there to approve the project on the transmission aspect of it, which was already approved by the transmission department of PREPA on May 28th of 2020. So we have a Zoom call scheduled with Luma this week, actually, I'm waiting for the date where we're gonna then just re-highlight what everybody else knows already, just go through the process where Luma signs off on the interconnection. And then that goes back to PREPA, to their board, for approval and then over to the oversight board for final approval. The reason that we are very confident and the, and the reason that PREPA is coming around or has come around is because we know the, when the RFP was done on tranche one, the outcome of that was substantially higher than what our bid was. And we stated that in our argument, if you can remember a year ago, a year and a half ago to the oversight board was if you 
do not accept this long 12 year process in negotiation to get the best agreement. And now you think if you go to the public out to the public with an auction, an RFP, that you're going to get a better result. You're absolutely wrong. You're actually going to get higher prices. And we quoted what PREPA quoted because initially PREPA was quite upset with the oversight board. PREPA quoted a case where a oil provider was providing a bilateral contract to PREPA to provide oil to run the generators in Puerto Rico. And the oversight board said, no, it has to be a public auction. And they put the contract out for public auction. And when they did, the public auction prices came out higher than the, uh, than the bilateral agreement. So they ended up going with the bilateral agreement at a higher price. So here we are today. The Montalva proposal is the most economic, beneficial project in the entire island. It is because we, have, we can build 160 megawatts versus 20 or 30 at most sites. We have the highest solar radiation in the island by far. It's the only area in the island where you see dry grass, dry grass during the rainy season. We've had a very key shareholder go there with his family about a year and a half, two years ago to witness that. So when you have higher solar radiation, you have higher yield. And when you have 40% higher yield, you can be 40% more effective. So we are the, the best financial solution for PREPA. And that's the only reason we are in settlement with PREPA. And also the federal government signed a deal with PREPA that if you want $11 billion in new transmission upgrade money, you're going to have to get these solar projects approved. So from the perspective of the financial oversight board, their only objective is to bring economic benefit to the island. And we are 40% cheaper, more efficient than the other contracts. And that's, docu that's documented. So now we have this positive attitude going along. Now, having said that, when you have a positive attitude, it doesn't mean you don't have 12 lawyers on the other side who are charging fees that the federal government's paying for. So, you know, everybody's making money as we go through the settlement process. But having said that, you know, we've paid our legal fees and we should be having a Zoom call with Luma this week. And that's what's being arranged right now. So we can get Luma sign off over to PREPA for board sign off and then over to the financial oversight board for sign off as well. All right. Thank you for that detailed response. Let's zoom in a bit for Roberta. I'm not sure how long do you have for the continuation of this call because we still have a lot of questions to cover. Oh, sure. Uh, I'll keep on going. Yeah. Okay. Then we'll do it in one time. So for Alberta, I saw this map on the website. It is a map that has uh, four oval areas uh, with ranging power capacities. And at the southeast, you see several dots for solar projects and wind projects. Can you briefly explain this map, please? Yeah. The Alberta situation is that we're going ahead with Westlake and we're working on coordinating a time for ribbon cutting. And, you know, Westlake's a big outfit. They have 18,000 barrels a day of oil production. They have a, a large staff and we're coordinating the ribbon cutting and it's based on their schedule, not ours, but it's going to happen very soon. We're fully aware when Devin joined us 18 months ago of what the Alberta grid looks like and what the interconnection maps look like. So, you know, what you have is you know, people go competitor as competitors as well, not just not just legitimate shareholders who have who have serious questions, but you have competitors who then scour the map looking for, you know, where where are good points of interconnection? Where do we think, you know, where do we think, you know, Greenbrier is connecting to? Because you do have this public document. Well, the one thing that everybody in the in the public, you know, can't get access to is that the most efficient way to build a solar project or a wind project or any renewable project for that matter is what's called an inside the fence project. And an inside the fence project means that you're building something within the property boundaries of a large industrial customer and you're providing energy to that plant instead of your load being satisfied from the utility coming in through the transmission line into a substation into some distribution lines and then finally into some switch gear and then onto your property into your industrial site, you actually now have a solar operations in those sites providing generation. And so the customer, in the case of Westlake, does not have to pull power from the grid. It has its own self-generation. And you, you do not have to get grid. You're not making a grid application for a high voltage application with Alta or with a distribution agreement with Fortis. You're working within the confines of what's called inside the fence. Everybody 
in Alberta can build their own inside the fence facility. I mean, the utilities don't like it because it's less power that they're selling, but it is how it is a faster an extremely faster way to go. It's way more confidential and it doesn't require a big brother to be bending over your shoulder, telling you what you can and cannot do. So you do see a lot of inside the fence in the U S obviously you have more industry in the United States than you have in Canada, but in Alberta, you do have a pricing environment where the carbon, the carbon footprint for a lot of companies that are in the, in the carbon business have to pay penalties based on a new schedule from the federal government that's making solar power extremely attractive, both for the user in the case of Westlake and from the generator in, in which is basically, uh, which is Greenbrier. So, you know, we've gone through all, we're going through all the models and the financials and the engineering with Westlake. We've done extensive work with them. We have teams that are working together on our side and their side. And when I was in Calgary, in April, um, four, five, six, we trying to push for an end of April opening and they're talking more like May. And that is just simply working with Westlake schedule. But to answer the question, we're not going to show on a map now, which of the Westlake sites we're going to build on. We'll have the ribbon cutting and then everybody will know where we're building and everybody will be happy at that point. So it, it is, it is the in it's an, these are inside the fence projects built within Westlake's own land holdings to satisfy their own load, to run their operations because they have hundred, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of wells and pumps and pipelines and distribution systems and filters and everything throughout Alberta. It's an extensive operation. They're not a massive oil company, but they're definitely what's called a mid-level upstream oil company that produces 8,000 barrels a day. So you can run the math yourself by figuring out what 18,000 barrels a day is. And I'm not gonna give you their electrical load because that's their, it's confidential, but they have a substantial electrical load that solar can provide both a hedge against energy prices and also a hedge against um, uh, carbon prices. So the Westlake situation will be happening very quickly. You know, apologize for not making it in Alberta, but I've got to, we've got to work with Westlake. They're working very hard. They have some massive projects they're doing with us that are on a global scale that we have not announced, but uh, that, that we will announce and uh, people will be happy. They're not happy today. They'll be happy. Uh, they'll be happy in the, in the not too distant future. All right. Thank you for uh, clarifying that inside the fence project. So it will not have to make use of the existing electricity infrastructure of the province. Monsignor asked if there are any other solar project planned in Alberta besides Westlake Energy, or did I miss something in uh, your last explanation that it's now called Westlake Energy? Well, no, we have, we have a, we have a 400 megawatt pipeline with Westlake. We find that to be very adequate. Devin's working with some big names here, um, on some other projects as well inside the fence. I can't disclose that, but I got to be happy to say that, that the pipeline with Westlake is 400 megawatts. That's a substantial, that's a substantial company building relationship. And we're very happy to be there. You know, I know what they're doing on the other projects they're working with us on. And I just, I simply can't say it. But, you know, we're pushing hard to get the ribbon cutting as soon as possible, but it'll be a very fast installation process because we're not dealing on a piece of, we're dealing with what they call brownfield. So brownfields are generally sites that are, you know, I don't want to say contaminated, but they're basically in industrial properties that have had, you know, brown type industries on them for a long time. And environmentalists want to do everything to get renewable energy to be built on these brownfield sites. Because if they're not built in these brownfield sites, then sort of the rehabilitation purposes is just sort of the remnants of, you know, an, an old industrial site or oil or old gas fields or oil, oil fields. I mean, when you're in the renewable energy business, the most sought after piece of property or locations that you can find are what's called building on a brownfield site, building inside the fence brown, brownfield. That is the nugget, the gold nugget of the renewable energy industry. You don't want to go to a new piece of land, go through all the permitting, spending the year. I mean, you have to do it when you have to do it, but going through all the years of doing all the work, like we've done in Montalva and doing everything. And then, and then going, you know, all doing all your transmission, interconnection applications or whatever that takes time to do that. And there, there, by the way, there are, there are sites in Alberta that are fully permitted 
that have full interconnection access that, that we can buy. So we're fully aware of them. We know all the owners, but nothing is better than doing something inside the fence. And that's the direction that we have been at with Westlake now for the last eight months. So when the news comes out, the news will come out. All right, excellent. Last one, and then we have most of them covered. Marketing, com communication, and strategy. As several investors pointed out that some of the perception issues for Greenbrier is that most dates that are set forth for major catalysts and presentations or press releases always postponed. And this has a negative impact on how a lot of investors perceive the company. Yeah, obviously no one can predict the future or foresee adverse advance beyond the company's control. You had some period of uh, bad luck throughout the years, a lot of uh, things you could not foresee. Also a lot of good things have happened, but with regards to dates, have you ever considered putting forward more conservative dates? Well, I think, I think, you know, number one is th that question's really, that question is really about people trying to time the market. If you, if you look at, if you look at my posts on Stockhouse. 95% of green bars owned by people who've known me for long periods of time, who are themselves very significant and successful real estate people who understand the timelines. If you look at their own real estate projects, you know, I have a friend who has a, you know, 51 story building that's now under construction in Toronto. It's not a reflection on green bar, but his, his project was delayed two or three years by the city government of Toronto you know, things happen. And if you put timelines out there, you're not going to have city governments respond either. People only respond to timelines by throwing things out. You base things on what the process actually takes, because if you don't do it, if I tell the city of Tehachapi, oh, guess what? I've got shareholders that are worried about me not meeting my obligations. Let's put the precise development plan to the middle of 2023. The city government's going to do in 2023. When, when you deal with infrastructure assets, you're always dealing in, you're always dealing in with government entities and government entities are run by bureaucrats and, and bureaucrats have even the good ones. They have their own business model. Their business model is not based on satisfying a shareholder. Unfortunately, it's not, their business model is not based on that. Right. So I'm not happy with the timelines, but I give our best guess of what we're doing and what we can do. And I think 95% of the people get it. Uh, the, the unfortunate part is the other 5% are people looking for making, you know, making a win, not sarcastically in the sense of quick win, because people, people that come in for a quick win and they're in the deal for a couple of years are going to say, Hey, I'm not, I'm not in it for a quick win, but they felt that they could time the market based on their timing the market. You know, there's a fundamental problem with that because anybody in the market historically over the last hundred years. If you try to time the market on something, you're going to miss 60 to 70% of your opportunity. If you don't believe in the value of the assets and that the company is doing everything in its power to go to conclusion in all of its projects, then you should get out and you should get off of Stockhouse and you shouldn't be trying to agitate the 5% that is really affecting the stock price. The people that I know, the families that I know, that own two, three, more, four, five million shares of Greenbrier, they don't go to stock. They, they look at Stockhouse, but they surely don't go there. They go there and look what, what the mood of, of the 5% is doing. But the goal of these people in Stockhouse is sort of to, number one, show that I have a voice. There's multiple reasons, right? Show that I have credibility. I can put somebody down. If something doesn't go my way, I'm going to start saying that the company is run by criminals and all this kind of stuff. And what it, all it does is it affects the 5% that where their emotions are played on Stockhouse. And those 5% of those emotions are actually affecting the day-to-day -day stock price. It's not the guys that own four or 5 million shares. They've been continually adding to their positions all along. And so uh, I think it's completely inappropriate to say that somehow their share performance is going to get enhanced if I decide to push dates farther back. I think, I think you have to celebrate the assets that are there. And if there was truly an objective by the people that were posting, publicly posting, that are complaining to have a bigger share price, they would be celebrating the fact that we've created an asset value as an example with Sage Ranch, because there's an argument, well, let's wait for the P&L statement. No, Sage Ranch has a $124 million discounted net present value that we can throw in our balance sheet. If we wanted to sell that asset at 50% of its value, 
that would be over $2, it would be around $2 and 50 cents a share Canadian. I'm not selling the asset just to appease somebody's immediate gain. If I'm throwing another $60 million off of the table away, it doesn't make any sense. I'd rather have 20, I'd, I'd rather have 28 million a year US of net profit for six years than to just simply play it as a stock play to meet, to meet the objectives of somebody's frustration that they bought at X price. We didn't meet, meet a date. So now they're upset. And now they're going to tell the whole world that we're really a bad company. It doesn't make any sense. You know, look at the value, you know, talk to somebody in the real estate industry, talk to people about Altus. Are they a gold plated? Are they the, the, the guilt edged evaluator of feasibility for real estate? Understand the value of that. Understand that we're working around the clock. Understand in bad market conditions, we had some very wealthy people buy 2 million units at $1.25. The people that I have in this company long-term are looking for $10 multiples and higher, much higher. And I'm very unhappy when the stock price is down. I'm unhappy when things get posted on Stockhouse that are so outrageously incorrect. When little pieces get taken from here and there and they're kind of welded together, one person keeps on regurgitating this water issue. There's five ways that there's no water issue. First of all, we were never sued. We are served with a document because we are under law, what's called an interested party. The city is its own utility. They can provide us all the water they want. The argument is between the water district and the city, but there's a piece of law in California that even supersedes all of that. And it says, if you provide deeded water rights, the district has to provide that. There's no legal argument with the district. We've already provided minimum half of the deeded water rights. If I go and get the other half of the deeded water rights, which I can do in 30 days, the water district can't even sue the city, but it's actually suing the city on other issues. If you look at the litigation, it's suing the city because it doesn't like how the, the water district, uh, the city makes water allocations and things like that. There's a whole bunch of things that are not relative to Sage Ranch that the water district's doing with the city. It has no bearing on where Sage Ranch is going to go or slowing down the dates. This is a very standard procedure in California. When someone does a CEQA document, there's always like 20 to 30 agencies filing suit, complaining about something. In our case, it was one agency and that one agency doesn't have any ground to stand on. I've been in three months of settlement negotiations as a witness between the city and the water district. I know where that negotiations is and I can't talk about it because I'm, I'm under a signed document that I can't say anything. But again, aside from all of that, aside from all of that, if we provide the deeded water rights, you can't, you cannot get a court order to stop Sage Ranch. And you can't get a court order to stop Sage Ranch right now. So there's a lot of misinformation that's put out there. It does aggravate me. I'm not happy with it. I'm not happy with the, um, uh, you know, if you have anybody that wants to get slightly creative or if I had more time, is you create a social media platform where you don't get a, a public company officer, you actually get a legitimate third party who allows people to have a conversation uh, like you're doing right now and as soon as somebody starts calling somebody a criminal or, a th or this person's stealing money or this person is screwing this guy, that they can shut down that conversation. It doesn't have to be a company person to do that. The, right now, the market lacks, the public markets in Canada, the United States lacks a forum where you can have a discussion where you can be moderated in not saying things that are offensive. Offensive doesn't mean hey, you know, management puts out dates and they're always running behind. That doesn't offend me because I, I gave the answer. You got to put dates that are realistic. And if you're dealing with government officials, you're always getting pushback because that's how government operates. But if you say, Jeff Chahersky is a criminal because this, take, this thing has taken two years and he hasn't met any dates and he's stealing money from the company and his, and the comp you know, and his friends are benefiting, that person should be cut off, number one. And number two, if you go in a forum like Stockhouse, then a person like myself does hire a lawyer. I do get court orders. And I have actually the names and addresses of individuals now that have posted things by saying very nasty things. And I have the own, my own discretion whether I want to file a, a lawsuit relative to collecting money for what they've said. And it, it's, it, that's up to me to do that. But getting access to somebody's name is very easy these days. Even if you hide behind a VPN, 
and you go behind their court orders are very powerful and you can get the addresses and the location. So I don't feel that we've ever purposely set dates because we wanted to mislead somebody or anything like that. We're dealing in the real world, government agencies, they, they have their own business model and we work around the clock. We build up value. Look at what we've accomplished with Sage Ranch. Look at the Altus report. You'll see what's going to happen in Alberta and you'll see what's going to happen in Montalvo. And we've got a couple other major projects. One I've alluded to with Paul Morris that we cannot talk about until it you know, gets done. So there's a lot of things that are really going on. And is Greenbrier completely oversold? Absolutely. But it's not oversold by 95% of the shareholders. It's, it's oversold. I mean, we were down to a dollar today. I think we traded when we were down a dollar, we traded like 30,000 shares. There's just, there's just, you're, you're talking about a small group of people, a small little float of people that are, that are ignited on issues that they feel they need to generate for their own benefit. I mean, some people post on Stockhouse because uh, I think one guy posted on a Stockhouse thing, asked a question. One of his questions was, do we pay people to go on Stockhouse? Are you kidding? Like, who would post? I mean, number one, we don't pay any social media people. We've never paid anybody. Why would we post a guy on Stockhouse? I mean, what, that would be quite insane. So I think people do post on Stockhouse because there are certain stocks that are probably promoted by groups of people that do promote on Stockhouse and they probably get some remuneration. And when they come over to Greenbrier, they feel by making arguments that the company is not doing this or doing that, that they can try to use this, these statements as sort of concrete evidence that they're smart people and intelligent people and use it for their resume. I have no idea. It's a very bizarre. It really is bizarre that any grown adult can post something in Stockhouse and just post something so stupid and so idle is beyond recognition. But unfortunately, they, they're they dealing with a CEO that believes in integrity, believes in honesty, and I like the information to be factual. And, and I, I, you know, I apologize on behalf of the government agencies that we have to deal with that things run a little behind, but it's nothing that we like and it's nothing that we do to try to mislead anybody. It's simply when you're dealing in big, big sizable projects that deliver big, big rewards, you've got to go with the rhythm of the government agencies that you deal with, right? We're not selling widgets. We're not selling something that three months later is going to be, you know, new technology is going to be replaced by. We're not drilling holes, praying that we're going to hit a good intersection. We're not doing phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, hoping that the next drug that we modify is going to, you know, save the world from some disease, but you've got to spend $10 million a month doing that. I deal in things that Savannah and I mentioned this to your audience before I deal in assets that I go to sleep. And when I wake up in the morning, the assets have more value than they do the night before. And I'm comfortable with that. And we have not found a promotional group yet that we want to work with because 99% of promotional groups are not good because they do multiple projects. 80 to 90% of those public companies don't work out. They have no following. And to find the right promotional group is very, very difficult. We're talking, talking about two groups right now. And when we find the right group that can deliver the message in a professional way that, that can actually deliver and bring a big, broader audience to Greenbrier, we are more than happy to engage them. It's not an easy job, not because we don't like working hard. It's because 99% of promotional groups don't have the following that can do any justice for Greenbrier. So we're looking after that as well as we move along. But sorry for the long-winded explanation on that. I just wanted to give a thorough explanation. Yes, okay. Thank you for that, Jeff. Okay, then I think we can round up. Thank you, Jeff, for your time today. It was uh, very interesting again. Let's Thank hope you, uh, let's hope good things will come to good people in the right time. Thanks. Thanks. Um, talk okay. to you later. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.